Let's do this. Hello, and welcome to the National Oceanography Center's Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Alejandra Sanchez-Franks, and today I'm joined by Dr. John Gold and Victoria Ingalls for a very special episode where we're going to recap one of the most important scientific expeditions of all time, the Challenger Expedition. Welcome, John and Victoria. Um, do you guys want to tell us a little bit about yourselves? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm Victoria Ringles. I'm Senior Curator of Portsmouth at the National Museum of the Royal Navy, where I've been working for about the last 20 years. And I'm John Gould. I have an Emeritus Fellowship here at the uh, National Oceanography Centre. Um, I'm a physical oceanographer and uh, started work in the uh, late 1960s and uh, Still working today, like all scientists, they never retire. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, okay, so let's let's start at the start with the Challenger expedition. Can um, both of you tell us, not at the same time, um, about the Challenger expedition itself, what it was, and what made it important? Shall I start? You can start. Your all right. <laughs> well, I think the Challenger expedition was the the 1870s equivalent of a trip to the moon in the 1960s. It was a voyage into the unknown. Uh, the first time that any expedition had been mounted to go all the way around the world, not just looking at islands and not just using the ocean as the means of getting there, but actually finding out what was below the surface of the ocean. And it came about really because the 1870s was a period of rapid technological development. And one of those technologies was submarine cables. They were starting to link the continents of the world together. Communication was improved. Uh, but in order to lay those cables, you needed to know what the bottom was like, how deep it was. And when cables had been pulled up from the seabed, it was found that things were growing on them. What was living at the bottom of the ocean? Here was a chance to find out. Wow. Victoria? And, you know, from the Navy's point of view, um, it's an opportunity to expand their knowledge in terms of surveying and hydrography. So they had embarked scientists on um, um, voyages in the past, but this was the first time that it really was a sort of primarily scientific expedition that they were supporting. So it's, it's a new venture for them as well. That's incredible. And um, as you've both been talking about what has set the Challenger expedition apart one important um, point about this is that maybe it wasn't the first scientific expedition of the time, but it was one of uh, the ones that was largest to scale. And how, how long did it last? What, where, where did they go? Well, the, the Challenger sailed in December uh, 1872 and uh, did not return to the UK until uh, the late spring of 1876. So she was away for four years, went down through the Atlantic, um, round Cape Horn, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Cape of Good Hope, spent some time in South Africa and then went down to the Antarctic, right down to the ice edge, um, came back uh, to across the uh, Southern Ocean to Australia, New Zealand, up through the Pacific, spent a lot of time in the Western Pacific, and then across the Pacific, round uh, Cape Horn, and back through the Atlantic and home again. That's amazing. And how long was how long did it take them to go? So it was four years. Oh my gosh, <laughs> um, quite a lot longer than today's expeditions. Um, which are usually maybe a couple of weeks to a few months. So what was the, was the ship, uh, Navy ship, what uh, was it created for this expedition or was it already in existence? So the, the ship 
was launched um, in 1858 um, and had served four years on the Australia station before it was identified as the ship that would um, go on this global expedition. Um, but they did have to adapt the ship before it could go. So um, it was taken to Sheerness, um, they stripped off 15 of the 17 guns that were on board to create... Don't need guns for science. <laughs> <laughs> well, they kept two, just in case. Just in case, okay. <laughs> um, but um, that created much more space on the upper deck. So then they um, were able to put um, darkroom in as well. So this was the first expedition that would carry um, a photographer on board wow. um, rather than just an artist. Um, and then obviously you've got space for um, bringing up the dredging samples and to be able to, to review those. Um, obviously creating and adapting cabin spaces for the additional scientists that they're bringing on board. So all these little adaptations that they made um, to, to enable the ship to, to go on the expedition. Was there anything that they were, was most of what they were doing to the ship at the time kind of in standard to what was done for uh, collecting uh, new samples or any sort of science endeavors or was there um, anything that was being pioneered or new based on the technology? John, you mentioned that uh, cable was the sort of new thing at the time. Well, yes. Um, as I say, it was a, a time of rapid change. So traditionally, uh, everything on ships was uh, was lowered over the side on a on a rope and and that's the way that challenger did its work it it carried uh, 30 miles worth of, uh, of of sounding line um wire rope such as we use today w was available then um, but they had to be robust they had to be able to uh, to repair things and uh, since wire rope was a new technology, they tended to stick with what was traditional and what they knew would work, and and what the crew would knew how would know how to how to repair. And speaking of the crew, mm. can you tell us a bit more about them and what the conditions were like? What was life like aboard the Challenger during this expedition? Yeah, so a ship of this size had a crew of just over two hundred and fifty, so about twenty officers and it had about 50 boys on board so these are oh, sort of 14 goodness. year olds but that was stand practice within the navy at the time so you know you could join as a boy learn the skills and develop on up through um, the ranks um, so it's a real mixed bag of, of men and it was all men at the time um, all thrown in together for the duration of this um, sort of nearly four year voyage so it's a long time to be cooped up together in a small space that's um, incredible and the um how big was the challenger is it about 76 meters is that right yes around about that I can't remember <laughs> exactly. so so with that volume of people how many people to a room um well the officers would have cabins um but not all the officers would have their own cabin so the captain would have his own cabin and in fact his cabin was divided up so that the chief scientist um, could have an equivalent amount of space <laughs> themselves. So a lot a lot of that sort of seniority of sort of rank um, did come down to physical space as well. So the more senior you were, the more that you would have your your own space. But these were working spaces as well. It's not just your bedroom, you know, that's where you kept your kit. And, you and know. they must have had space for labs as well and for all the samples. Absolutely, yeah. As so well they, as all those there people. There were labs on board. Um, you know, some of the ammunition stores became stores for the samples that they were collecting. Um, so, you know, space on a ship is at a premium and, and um, you know, crews are very adapt at squeezing in things where they can. And, and they, they used to living cheek by mouth with things. So, you know, the sailors, unlike the, the officers with their cabins, would be slinging their hammocks every night down the, the deck. So, <laughs> you know, you've got sort of nearly 200 people slinging their hammocks each night. Um, oh, that's incredible. Don't do hammocks nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not. So, it, you know, it's very different, as you say, to, to what you would expect today if you were going to sea. You mentioned an interesting point about the captain sharing his space with the chief scientist. Were they kind of on equal footing in terms of the hierarchy of operations? 
or was this very much a Navy-led um, expedition, even though the purpose was scientific discovery? This was very much organized and led by the Navy, is that? Well, the, the Navy would have absolute control over the operation of, of the ship. Um, so, you know, they are steering, and this is a ship as well, we didn't mention earlier, that's not just under sail, it's also got steam engines as well. Um, so steam engines are still a relatively new technology at the time, um, but it just enables you to, to sort of um, operate the ship in a different way and to keep the ship stable when you're trying to to do your soundings and, and your experiments and collecting your samples. So it, it gives you more flexibility, but equally you need to be very astute um, at knowing how both operations work in terms of managing the ship. So the crew very much were in charge of the ship um, and how it were operated, but the scientists were very much leading on what they were collecting, how it was done. But I think there was a certain amount of partnership there as well. So certainly Captain Narris, um, you know, they, they tried an initial trawl first with some equipment that had been brought on board. It wasn't very successful, but Narris suggested um, adapting it to a different technique. And that was more successful, and that was the technique they then adopted for the rest of the voyage. So there was... Real partnership. Partnership wow. there. And, and certainly for the Navy, they were undertaking their own um, observations and what have you to feed back to the hydrographic office. So, you know, they were used to sort of um, taking observations and, and um, recording right. parts of the voyage as they went along anyway. So it just gave a slightly different focus. So the two did seem to work quite well together overall on this voyage. So on a, again, on a voyage of this scale with this many people and a duration of four years, what was the biggest concern um, at the time for, you know, completing the mission successfully? Um, it, it's just keeping going, I guess. I, I mean, I think for the average sailor on board the main deck, boredom was a huge, huge factor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for them, after the initial excitement of doing something different on a naval voyage and seeing the scientific mission, they were quite excited the first time the dredge came up. Um, mm. that it quickly tailed off the interest <laughs> and um, they soon called it dredging because it would take many hours for dredges um, to get down to the appropriate depth and then to bring up the samples. So that for the sailors, they quickly became bored and it was quite hard to retain their interest and, and certainly many deserted by the end of the voyage. So um, I think for them, it maybe lacked the excitement that it had the possibilities of um, going to exciting places. Many of the places they, <laughs> they stopped at weren't necessarily of interest to sailors because these didn't have um, the big cities with all the attractions. It was more about um, the botany that was ashore and things like that. Right. It got old maybe after a few years. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, what do you reckon, and we, we touched, mentioned briefly earlier about uh, more modern oceanography, but, um, and this goes to both of you, what do you reckon is the biggest difference um, in this expedition, which was in 1872, to sort of modern day scientific ocean expeditions? Well, I think to pick up on what Vicky just said, uh, so far as the crew was concerned, it probably wasn't much different from a modern day voyage. They spent much more time out of sight of land than typically uh, one would on a, on a commercial vessel or a, or a naval ship. Um, the, 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 I think the real issue was that uh, they were going out into the unknown. Uh, they hadn't a clue how deep the ocean was, for instance. Nowadays, we can, uh, we know, we can just run an echo sound and we know immediately how deep it is. Uh, for them, the first thing they had to do whenever they uh, went to make observations was to find out how deep it was. Um, and then everything else followed after that. And uh, the... the the, re the real success, I think, of, of Challenger and, uh, and what could have gone badly wrong was the level of collaboration between the ship's officers and crew and the, and the team of scientists. Had they not developed a good working relationship uh, 
it could have been a disaster. But it wasn't. It was a huge success. So what do you reckon, going towards that, um, how did the scientists have to prepare? What sort of scientific um, preparation did they do for the work they wanted to carry aboard the ship? Well, first of all, the, the design of the Challenger expedition was based on observations that had been made in the North Atlantic uh, in the previous decade or so, uh, in which they had used sounders to sample the seabed, to measure how deep it was. They had used thermometers to measure the temperature of the ocean. Um, and so they had a clue as to how to do it and, uh, and, and what they might expect. And so the, um, they, as with any uh, major undertaking, the first thing they did was to set up a committee. And so there was a committee of the Royal Society um, which drew on all of that knowledge and drew up a, a, a set of plans as to where the ship should go uh, and what it should do and, uh, and, and to a large extent how it should do it. Um, but the North Atlantic isn't necessarily typical of the whole of the world ocean. So, um, so is it fair to say that at that point they had experience exclusively uh, based only on the North Atlantic and this was going to be the first time that they were going to try and get a similar sort of data bank of results but for the entire uh, pretty, pretty global ocean. So. Pretty much that's true, yes. Yep. Wow. Yep. Yep. So, so based on that small sample of observations in the North Atlantic, you design a voyage that goes around the world, goes down to the Antarctic, goes into the Pacific, um, and, uh, and, and avoid, as I said, a voyage into the unknown. That's incredible. So you mentioned uh, briefly about how one of the most important things uh, upon which everything else rested was ocean depth. Yes. which right now we, we take for granted. We have, you know, so many technological advances. How were they, how are they going about getting those measurements back then? Right. So the Challenger carried tens of miles of sounding line. So basically rope, which was uh, about half an inch diameter. Uh, on the end of that, they hung a weight, a sounder, um, which weighed about uh, 45 kilos. And when they got to the position where they wanted to make an observation, they dropped that over the side um, and measured the time that it, it was marked every, uh, every so many fathoms. Uh, they measured the time that it took for each, uh, each 100 meters or 100 fathoms to go out. And... Uh, when that rate slowed, they realized that the thing was on the bottom. They would then haul it back. And they had a little steam engine to help haul things back, back in. And when the tension became greater, that was the, an estimate of the depth of the ocean at, at that point. And the sounder would, would take a sample of the, of the seabed. So they, they then knew whether it was mud or rock or shell or sand or, or whatever. So immediately they knew something about the ocean. They knew how deep it was. They knew sort of what the bottom was made of. Um, having done that, uh, they would then uh, deploy... Oh, and that, that would also uh, take a, a sample of seawater at the, at the bottom as well. And, uh, and so then they would deploy uh, thermometers, lower thermometers, a number of them on a wire, now, one of the things that they didn't really know was how temperature varied with depth. They knew from the North Atlantic that it was colder at the bottom than it was at the top. Uh, but they didn't know what that profile of temperature was. And that was one of the reasons for, for, for measuring temperature. The, the thermometers were also pretty primitive. Um, to measure temperature in the ocean is quite a difficult thing because you have a huge amount of pressure on the thermometer which can affect the reading. Uh, and you, you bring that thermometer back up through warmer water. And uh, so the question was uh, how, to, how to interpret those measurements and they learned a great deal very quickly that uh, 
things weren't uh, quite as simple as they always found it in the North Atlantic. Um, they took samples of seawater. They were quite interested in the chemistry of seawater. Uh, the idea of salinity, which is a concept we know now, was, was almost in its infancy. Um, now we measure it effectively by uh, measuring the, 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 the electrical conductivity of a seawater sample. Then they did it by measuring the density of a seawater sample. And so they, they brought these back up and measured the density of the seawater at sea, which was not an easy thing to do on a ship that was rolling around and doing it <laughs> and trying to do it quite accurately. So having done that and probably having measured the uh, currents, which were important to know, they would then set about uh, dredging. So they'd put down a much bigger, uh, thicker wire uh, with uh, a, a effectively a metal cage on the bottom and they would dredge this. Uh, I should just say that of course between between stations as we call them, the observation points, between stations uh, the ship would be under sail and the first thing they would have to do then when they reached the place they were going to make the observations was to fire up the engine so that the ship could hold its position using the using steam power. Uh, so that that took quite a while. Um, so they would then take samples of the seabed, dredging away, bringing up samples of the animals, um, of uh, the rocks on the sea, uh, seabed, uh, bring those up on board so that the scientists could, could look over them. They would drag nets through the water, both horizontally and vertically, uh, to take samples of, uh, of the the the, the plankton and, and fish and such like that were that were living there and those samples would be preserved um, and uh, and so they would uh, having done all that and they would spend about typically about 12 hours in each position doing this work working in just in daylight hours so they would start probably before breakfast in the morning and finish in early evening um, with the samples on deck, all the mud and the the, uh, the bottom samples, which the scientists could then work on while the uh, while the ship steamed to the next position, and so uh, that's that was the sort of routine that they had. That's incredible. And so after these four years passed, and the Challenger circumnavigated the globe, gathering this absolute wealth of information for the first time in in history, they came back. To the UK triumphant. What was what was that like uh, from sort of the science side and from the from the Navy's perspective? Well, I think from the science side, it, they had probably achieved all that they could possibly have expected. Um, uh, the the leader of the expedition, Wyville Thompson, um, was uh, knighted and uh, and certainly uh, was was beca became really really rather famous and and then led a team of international scientists who uh, came to the offices that had been set up in edinburgh where um, all the uh, results were collated and the reports and the, the reports of the challenger expedition are all 50 volumes of them are, are, are sitting behind me here uh, an incredible amount of work which which took basically 20 years to to accomplish um, from the naval point of view i don't know <laughs> it it was basically the end of commission they they um signed off essentially when they got back to, to Chatham and the sailors all went their separate ways. But as I was saying earlier, actually, um, of the sort of 240 ish crew that started, only about 144 actually made it to that end point. <laughs> so majority was through desertion, but there were seven individuals who died during the course of the voyage and and then about 20 odd who were invalided out through through wow. sickness. So um, so they expected an attrition rate that was entirely normal. In fact, sickness on this voyage was entirely in line with what was standard within the Navy at the time. 
but the desertion rate was particularly high on this voyage. <laughs> wow, that's, yeah, um, I can say I sympathize a little. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but so uh, kind of equally on the return of the expedition, you know, great scientific success. Did the Navy perceive that as a success as well? Did they continue to get involved in this type of expedition? Um, I mean, since then, the Navy have continued um, to have involvement with um, scientific um, exploration as well. And that continues today with HMS Protector. Um, so that does a lot of work, particularly in Antarctica. Um, and, you know, that thread has, has gone on through, but it hasn't been that sort of big um, mission in the same way that Challenger yeah, was. It, it's right. more a thread that goes through as, as part of, of, you know, standard um, uh, missions and, and operations that they are involved with. So I think Challenger was sort of quite unique in that respect, but the... the that scale, the, yeah. The, yeah, but the... Um, research continues and it's a key part of of the work that the navy does you know it's um you know the work that the protector is doing is about sort of um getting to places that other vessels can't get to so if they're down there they're taking samples and feeding them back in and and certainly they do work with the notion national oceanography center as well and you know the oceanography center does help to train naval personnel in terms of using rovs and things like that so there's a real synergy there between the two communities still that's that's amazing um and how did this compare to other expeditions at the time um and maybe globally well uh, at the time uh challenger was unique um Nobody had ever done anything like that before. And it took a while to actually assimilate what had been found. As I said, it took 20 years to analyze the, all the results. Uh, but in fact, Challenger was not the only ship in the 1870s to go around the world. Um, they say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Um, the German Navy was newly formed. Uh, Germany had only recently been reunited. And uh, Germany held the Royal Navy in, in high regard. They regarded it as uh, the model of what a Navy should be. And so two years after the uh, Challenger sailed, um, the German Navy put together a similar round-the-world expedition aboard a, a ship called the Gazelle. Uh, if you put the two ships side by side, they would look almost identical. Um, they went around the world uh, in uh, two years less, um, only, only a couple of years, um, basically doing this exactly the same observations and using the same equipment as the Challenger. They, they came to uh, from Kiel to Plymouth where they picked up all the equipment that they would use and uh, off they went around the world. Um, the Gazelle expedition was rather less of a success than the Challenger, um, partly because uh, well, well, for two reasons. In, you could boil it down to health and safety. First of all, Gazelle spent much less time in port than Challenger, so the crew had much less time to recover. Um, they spent a lot of time in rather inhospitable places. They spent two months uh, lying off the uh, Kerguelen Islands in the South Indian Ocean, where the average temperature was only seven degrees. Not very nice for the crew with nothing to do, uh, just waiting while uh, a group of scientists went ashore to observe, uh, to make ast astronomical observations of the transit of Venus. So off they went from there, and uh, having spent some time in the in the in the uh, sub subantarctic, they then went to the tropics and spent a lot of time around New Guinea which the Germans thought was perhaps a good place to have a, a, a to set up a colony. Um, they had a terrible time. They ran out of coal, so the ship couldn't go anywhere. The crew had to go ashore and cut down trees to feed the boilers. And um, 
and they got all kinds of tropical diseases. And so uh, although the gazelle uh, made very similar observations uh, to the challenger, at very similar quality as well, uh, the outcome of the expedition was, uh, was not the success that Challenger had. Was, was scurvy ever an issue on these ships? Well, not, not so much on, on Challenger because all the crew would have been issued with lime juice, which the Navy had long experimented with and discovered that that helped to um, completely eliminate um, the effects of scurvy. However, I believe on Gazelle, the opposite was the case. So. That's right. Yes, the, the German Navy decided that lime juice was really rather expensive and hard to store. So why didn't they give crew, the crew um, citric acid instead? It probably tasted much the same. Horrible. Um, <laughs> But it had nothing. It did nothing to uh, prevent scurvy, and so scurvy broke out amongst the amongst the crew on on Gazelle, and there was a, a, a huge amount of illness there. Um, I, that that's one of the things that I, I hadn't realised until I started reading the reports um, that uh, the ships, because they had steam engines, could distill seawater and make their own fresh water. But it, um, the, the notes from the crew suggest that it wasn't very popular and was only really drinkable if it was mixed with either rum or, or lime <laughs> juice. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe um, one last set of questions to round up on uh, the Challenger expedition. Um, uh, this goes for both of you. What has been the impact of the Challenger expedition on modern oceanography and marine science and also in the, in the way the Navy operates? So in, in terms of the Navy, as I was saying before, you know, it's that um, involvement with scientific research is something that has continued from then and to the present, um, you know, certainly with HMS Protector operating um, down in Antarctica. So it, it's been a thread of naval um, operations since that time um, and there is a recognition of the importance for it you know to be able to operate well at sea you need to understand your environment around you and, and having that full awareness of it is is really really important even to the present day um, so it's it's had a huge impact even though there haven't been operations quite on the scale of challenger in the same way so it's set that benchmark for for yeah. that partnership yeah absolutely i think for challenger the reports themselves and the, the beautiful drawings are still of huge value to, uh, to uh, people in, involved in taxonomy, looking at how samples change and whether they are the same as they were you know, 150 years ago. Um, from the point of view of the observations, um, they actually are really very important um, because uh, the observations of temperature, and of uh, the salinity of the water, uh, tell us about the state of the ocean very early in the industrial era. So by that time, we hadn't really put much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and not much of it had been absorbed into the, uh, into the oceans. And so those 1870 observations provide a baseline against which we can assess uh, modern day change. And uh, I have looked at both the temperatures and the, and the uh, salinities, and you can quite see the warming of the, of the ocean and, and quantify it very nicely. You can see the acceleration of the, the trend that we see in the ocean of the salty areas getting saltier and the fresh areas getting fresher. Now, you might think that's something just to do with uh, the ocean, but, it's, but actually it's not, because what that is indicative, indicative of is the, uh, a, a strengthening of the hydro, global hydrological cycle, the evaporation of water from the sea surface, which produces rain and produces floods. So those are, those are vital observations. And similarly, looking at some of the biological samples, we can uh, make an assessment of the changes in the acidity of the ocean and its effect on, on marine organisms. So that, that's, 
the fact that those samples still exist, most of them are stored at the Natural History Museum in London, uh, mean that we have a resource uh, that is invaluable. That's incredible. Thank you so much for joining us, John and Victoria. To find out more about the Challenger Expedition and what modern ship expeditions look like today, you can visit our website at thenoc.ac.uk. If you're enjoying Into the Blue podcast, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app and follow us on social media so you don't miss out on future episodes. See you at the next one. Thank you.